I'd like to begin by uh, welcome you, welcoming you to our Business Builder Speaker Series. Uh, we do this the third Wednesday every month at 1 p.m., and we bring a different speaker and different topic that we think will be of value to the real estate agent community. We know that you're busy, and we appreciate you giving us your time. To make the most of your time, we encourage you to ask questions and participate utilizing the chat box. Before we get to our current month's speaker, I'd like to give you a preview of next month. Join us next month for our Business Builder speaker featuring Zach Knight, Lead Yourself so you can lead others more effectively. And that'll be February 15th from 1 to 2 p.m. Zach is a dynamic speaker, a former city of Atlanta police officer, a Marine in Afghanistan who was wounded in battle, who is now a business leader in Atlanta and helps veterans reintegrate uh, into a society after their uh, tour of duty. Uh, and he's also uh, written a book uh, and a lot of what he presents will be based on the book that he's written. This month's business builder is Leslie Robertson, an attorney at Shea Fritz and Dean, and she's going to speak about the top 10 things that agents should know. Leslie, go ahead and uh, share your screen, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Leslie. Okay. Um, just a second. I'm experiencing... I'm not seeing my um, screen share. It's the two, I apologize for this. Um, maybe I just hit my, get to my, you see that? No, okay. You should have the menu bar with mute and video. Okay, hold on. And here, then you here, select share screen. Here we go, okay. Thank you. And. Okay, so can you all see that? Yes, we see your okay. scared, uh, shared screen, Leslie. Thank you, take okay. it away. Okay, um, so the topic is the top 10, basically the top 10 things that we wish agents knew because this these are things that affect how smoothly we can turn a closing around for you. So um, just kind of some introductory things. I'm gonna spend about four to five minutes on 10 topics. Uh, so if you have any questions, just hold them for the end. You, you can um, put them in the chat uh, and then we'll address them at the end. And then there is, of course, our legal notice because we're attorneys just letting you know that it isn't legal advice. Uh, we're just kind of giving you some information. So uh, the first topic is contracts. Um, of course, contracts must be in writing. That is the basic, basic thing. Um, doesn't have to be on a fancy piece of paper. It can be on a cocktail napkin, but what it does have to have are the what we call the P's, which are parties, price, and property. The property part is really important. Um, we get very spartan descriptions of what's being sold, and sometimes um, after a title exam, we find out that we need to know more to make sure everybody's agreeing. You know, there could be uh, several parcels the seller owns. Um, you know, that just all kinds of things. So tax ID, street address, you know, it'd be great if you can have an exhibit to it or a copy of the deed or fill in the lot block, but the property is, is a big one. Um, so the more detailed, the better, just so that you don't have to litigate, you know, the, the things that were not filled out. It's also important to include the proper exhibits. If you have an HOA or a condo, you should have your condominium association attachment. You should also have a finance, financing contingency. Frequently, there are issues when these aren't fully filled out. Uh, st special stipulations. Uh, you don't want to just throw a bunch of rote ones in there. You want them to really mean something. You should utilize the index that GAR provides. Um, they've been thought out. But if there isn't um, you know, an item in the index and you have an, a situation, you know, get with your broker and, or ask us and we'll help you out. Okay, you wanna include the relevant information for the parties. The reason why contact information is important is for notice if something comes up, but also to help the, the uh, closing attorneys uh, get started on your file right away. We're gonna start needing items from the seller and um, we don't wanna bother you. You have other things that you're working on. 
So um, if you have a seller info there, we can call them right away and get things such as payoffs and homeowners association letters. Uh, also, if you can, um, oops, going back to that screen. Um, items we need are your commission agreement. Frequently, frequently we go, don't get those and we're kind of playing a guessing game. Um, if you have a pay at close or a disbursement authorization, and if you can get those items to us as quickly as possible, that helps us a lot if um, sometimes we'll look at a disbursement authorization and the sales price doesn't match and the commission doesn't match what we have in the file. So something has changed and we can then ask for that or there might be a mistake on them and we need, you know, you're gonna need to go through your broker again. So um, please get those to us early. If you can also forward on home warranties, um, not only the invoice, but also, um, you know, whatever documentation is telling us who's paying for it. Is there something in the contract that says it's the seller? You know, if it's not in there, then just let us know. Oh, I'm paying for it, you know. Um, this, and of course, make sure your pay at close matches that. Um, termite letters are helpful to get early in case there's a problem on the letter or there's an invoice that needs to be collected. Survey is very important, if, especially if one has just been done to get that to us immediately. So we can look that over and make sure we don't have a question. You know, title might come back and not really match the survey, or um, you know, there might be something on the survey like an encroachment or a mobile home that we're going to need to do additional title clearance on. So, you know, this gets into you know the fact that it takes time to do our closings. Um, we aren't really in the fast food business. I hate to put it that way, but we, we love it when we can turn around a closing really fast, we're proud of that, but sometimes things come up um, or there's just aspects to this property, like it's in an association, we need to get an association letter. Um, those can take time. Uh, we want to avoid you having to, your seller having to pay a rush fee. So um, you know, again, get us uh, connected with your seller quickly so they can provide us the information to obtain um, items like the association letter. Uh, so it takes time to run the title exam, get the association letter, it takes time to get payoffs. Um, sellers can help us get these items, um, but they can't actually get them for us, to, but they, we need their authorization and their information to find them. Um, title can bring back issue, can bring up issues such as missing interests, um, I'm working on one of those right now that may end up requiring litigation or at least getting a deed out of an estate. Um, I cannot promise the turnaround time on that. So um, just so people understand that, uh, sometimes we have open loans that haven't been canceled and we have to, you know, it's ancient, ancient history going to an old loan, you know, a loan company and trying to find out any information they have on an old loan. So uh, we just wanna let you know the items that can take time. Um, one second. Um, about the associations, uh, just if you can let your seller know that they, you know, usually are responsible for paying for the letter um, and getting with us so um, we can get that letter paid for, paid for before we order it. They're very expensive, so we do require payment up front. Um, also, if you can make sure that you uh, speak with all of the parties when you um, are scheduling and confirm with us and the lender. Um, that way we're all on the same page and we don't have people going to different offices at different times, that would help. Okay, I've kind of gone over that the need um, we have to, to talk to the seller right away. Generally, we need uh, the information from them to get the payoff. We also, a lot of uh, creditors require their authorization. Uh, creditors are also more responsive to if we have to get a third party involved. Sometimes they're more responsive to the third party, or and more responsive to the seller than, sorry, the third party. However, we're not asking you to get the payoff. We actually can't have you get the payoff. Um, our title insurers want the, it to come from, you know, us that we, you know, it was sent directly to us. Um, a lot of times with an equity line, uh, they try to pay it off and cancel it before. And um, all they really have is, you know, the seller just has basically something online showing they have a zero balance. 
we need to really handle this because we need to make sure it's canceled. So um, it's not enough to have a zero balance. Bankruptcy issues are another item um, that can take some time to work on. Uh, if seller is currently in it, they may need to go get leave of the court or they will if they're in it. They'll need to get leave of the court and we'll have to strictly comply with that order, um, the terms of the order. So um, if they have filed a bankruptcy before, uh, and this is only what since they bought the property, we don't care about when they filed before they ever bought it. But if they filed one, if, if you know that, then um, there is a chance that we're gonna find an open loan that hasn't been canceled. And the bankruptcy did, does not necessarily take care of that for title purposes. What it takes care of is the creditor's ability to personally go after uh, the client on the debt, but it doesn't actually take the lien. A lot of the bankruptcies do not take the lien off the actual property. Sometimes there is a need for an extra order. So um, if you know that they've been in bankruptcy, we probably should be informed so we can start looking into it. Okay, so we have community associations. Again, um, I've kind of gone over this a little bit. Um, main thing also is that um, there can be violations that the buyer should know about so they can address that. Um, also special assessments, uh, who's paying for what. And we have to get that letter because um, it's like it's a, like a mortgage payoff. It's, it's, it's a lien, whether or not um, the association has filed a lien, um, dues are lienable like property taxes. Um, they can be uh, a lien even without being having a lien filed. Sometimes they do file it um, after a judgment. Sometimes they file it before a judgment. Sometimes they don't file it, but it is kind of like a hidden lien. So that's why we have to get it and make sure we pay anything off. Um, sometimes we will have to get a separate payoff from a law firm because they have attorney's fees they need to put on it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about estate. Uh, estates. Um, if, you're, uh, if you know that um, the person selling wasn't the record title holder, perhaps they are the child of a person who's you know, passed away, um, or they are the surviving, say, spouse of, of someone who's passed away who also owned it, um, we may need to get into some um, due diligence to look up whether or not the person has the right to sell the property alone. Um, if they were a joint tenant with right of survivorship, we actually will just need a copy of the death certificate of the other owner. So a lot of times I'm like, oh no, someone passed away. I see that on the seller information sheet. And then I see the death certificate. I'm like, we're done. So that's great. So, you know, the more paperwork you can kind of give us up front, uh, the more helpful it is for us. Um, if they were not joint tenants um, or like, you know, it's a child selling it, um, there may be a need for probate or administration. Uh, probate is uh, what happens when there's a will. Administration is what happens when there wasn't a will. Pretty similar at the end of the day, um, but that's just so you know the names. Probate has, when there's a will, there's an executor. When there's not a will, there's an administrator. So um, that can take time. Uh, it can take a few months, even if it's uncontested and very simple, just to give someone the authority to sell. Uh, if they did not... Um, have the power to sell. I mean, just being appointed a representative does not necessarily mean you have the power to sell if the will didn't give it or the administration, you know, the league doesn't mention it. So then there can be an additional order that needs to be obtained. So I just want to let you know that. Um, if um, you know that that's going to need to happen, but you have a buyer, oops, I'm going to go back. I would encourage you to get uh, to put that in your contract. I had a closing, it went fine. They, they had a probate, they were working on it and they knew they had to get that additional leave to sell. They put it in the contract. They had an investor who was willing to wait, didn't need to move in the house right away. And they, they, they put that in there. Everybody knew about it, we knew about it. We knew that nobody was you know, expecting a miracle that this, this order had to come. So um, it's a good idea to put that in there. Um, Talk a little bit about entities and trusts. Uh, 
they're created under state law, they're registered in a state. Uh, we're gonna need to review the corporate documents of any entities we're working with. We need to see operating agreements for LLCs and bylaws for corporations. Uh, if necessary, we, we're gonna need to get resolutions. We can help with that, um, but we do need to see those. If you have a sole member, they may not have those, you know, they might not have an operating agreement or bylaws, uh, we'll usually just have them sign an affidavit, but we will need to look on the state records to see if we see any other names, we're, we're gonna ask like, who is this person? You know, someone else have an ownership interest. Uh, they need to be uh, active. Uh, so make sure dues are paid. That's a good thing to check right away because um, it might take them, you know, maybe not a long time, but they need to get online and pay. Um, there might be an issue keeping them from being able to get, you know, active, you know, active status. Um, so these are the kinds of things you want to um, get on. And the main reason you might want to ask right away is that you want to make sure that whoever's signing the contract and the agreement to pay your commission is actually authorized to do that. So when you have entities as a client, I'd go ahead and you know say we're going to need your corporate paperwork, you know your bylaws, your or your operating agreement, and um, uh, resolutions if necessary. They may already have resolutions. So okay. trusts are similar to entities. You know they are. Um, not an individual, they are, you know, a what's called a fictitious, kind of a fictitious person. Uh, you have to have someone who has the authority to act in a trust. Um, there is a trust instrument, which like the bylaws or um, the operating agreement is the, the operating guide or the rules for the trust. It'll name who can act, it'll name whether they can sell and, so, and who beneficiaries are. Um, we need to review those. Uh, people are often very um, unwilling to produce them, unfortunately, either maybe just because it's a huge document in some cases, uh, or they want, want to be private. We're not going to put this information out there to anybody. Um, there is, whenever you know, authority has to be shown in the public records, it's acceptable to record a certificate of trust, which just says the trustee had, had the authority, nothing has changed. A trust existed. That's that's it. So we're not putting anything out there, but we have to review it to make sure that we're not going to have a title issue if somebody comes back on it. So um, I've had people who don't want to send the whole thing over, but are very willing to come into an office. Just here's what I have, and we're happy to look through it, make the copies. You know. Um, so just if you have a trust, make sure that they um, also are ready to produce paperwork with estates, entities, and trusts. Um, we are going to need generally to um, issue the proceeds in the name of the entity or the trust so um, or the estate. So just get them ready for that and ask if they have an account. Um, just talk about taxes a little bit. Um, property taxes do have to be collected at closing. They have to be paid off, um, just so everybody knows. Um, and we will prorate, uh, you know, if we have a current tax bill, um, we can prorate exactly the number of days, the exact amount. If we have to estimate, estimate because the bill's not out, you know, we will do our best. Um, we will use the last year's taxes generally. We do have everyone sign an acknowledgement uh, at the end of the settlement statement that they understand that we had to guess and that we can guarantee it. And if something comes up later, if the bill is drastically different, the parties agree amongst themselves to work out the difference. I'm gonna talk about withholding at closing. This happens when we have a non-resident of Georgia or a non-US citizen selling. With the Georgia withholding, the amount is 3% of the sales price, or it can be reduced to 3% of the gain which sometimes means nothing's, nothing is withheld because the gain needs to be at least $20,000. Otherwise it's exempt. You can give us um, a formula. Uh, generally we'll start with the um, 
the which what it was bought for, which we can find by looking at the deed and seeing the transfer tax. Uh, that doesn't actually, we can't do that if it was bought at foreclosure because sometimes there isn't any, any but um, generally we take the current sales price, subtract it from the purchase price. And you already have, you know, a lot of times um, a, a, a reduction there. Um, you can also gather expenses and report those to us too. So we can just calculate that and withhold less or again, nothing. There are exemptions also, so we don't even need to get to the formula. One is if your buyer it was was a, is, I mean, this was their primary residence, and um, like basically they just moved. Um, the other is, oops, I just knocked this thing. Um, oops. Um, the other is uh, if if you have um, an out of state seller who owns, continues to own property in Georgia, if they have filed Georgia tax returns for two years and will file again next year, um, and they own property in Georgia, if those three items apply, they all have to apply, then they are exempt. If they're um, an entity, they also have to be registered to do business here. Um, if they're a person, obviously they, they don't. Uh, federal withholding is called FERPDA for short. That's 15% of the sales price. Uh, we can't do the formula we talked about with Georgia. It's 15% of the sales price. And that can obviously be an issue if you have mortgages being paid off and things like that, because that's a large chunk. Uh, green card holders are not required um, to be withheld. So, you know, don't worry if they're um, a non-resident alien uh, or a resident alien, sorry. Uh, if they are not a green card holder, if they have lived here long enough and they're not on a visa, we can have them fill out an affidavit. Also, if the buyer is purchasing for less than 300,000 and they intend to occupy, they can sign an affidavit. So these are some of the ways to not have to withhold. We do need a social security number or tax ID number. Um, as long as they initiate the application while we're closing, we should you know, be okay. But you know, whatever they are, make sure that they have that or are working on getting that. If they're subject to withholding, but they feel that they should not have to have 15% withheld, they can get, they should get with an accountant, but they can apply for a certificate from the IRS. Um, they can do that anytime up until the day of closing. We do have to withhold the 15% um, until the certificate is given to us, but um, that is something, you know, they can go, you know, make their case the IRS for less withholding and um, just show us that you're doing that. 1099 forms, you know, there's always a lot of tax forms that sellers are, um, you know, signing at the table. We have to report our transactions. So that's why we issue one. Talk a little bit about divorce. I've had a lot of those I've been working on lately. Um, if your seller has not filed yet, unless they have some reason they need to go ahead and do it, you might urge them not to if they are in agreement about how they're handling their, you know, transaction and getting paid. Um, because once they file, there is a standing order that prevents real estate transactions. Um, they would have to apply for leave from the court, special leave. Um, so that could be a delay. Um, you know, but sometimes we do close during pending divorces, but we have to really handle it on a case by case basis. Um, I'm just, I don't want to, I mean, I shouldn't get into too much detail, but um, if a divorce has been finalized, we have to follow the terms of the divorce. So if you know that your seller has been divorced since they owned the property, we are not concerned with the divorce before. Um, we're gonna to have to look at it even if the other spouse was never on title because we need to make sure that they aren't required to be paid out or, or sign over a deed. So if you know that there's been a divorce, please get the paperwork to us if you can. We can pull it from title possibly, but if it's older, it may take a while. And it also may be hard to find. It may not come up in the title exam because it was filed in a different county or the names of the parties were different than what's on title. Okay, 
And divorce isn't always a title transfer and there may be a deed needed from the other party. So, you know, a lot of times the divorce attorneys miss that. So, you know, sometimes we have to go talk to the ex-spouse. I'll talk about mail away and powers of attorney. Uh, always let us know as soon as possible if a party can't come to the closing. Um, powers of attorney for buyers, if there is a, a loan, they need to be approved by the lender. They literally, you know, we need to send the actual power of attorney and have them look it over. So um, with sellers, it may take time for us to do some due diligence. Uh, if the seller is, we're gonna have to see, um, again, we would prefer to draft the power of attorney and have it be specific. Um, But if there's a reason that that can't happen, then we're gonna maybe have to do some due diligence. It, perhaps the seller is disabled now. We're going to have to see the existing power of attorney, see which kind of kinds of powers are in there. We may need to contact the doctor and get a letter saying that the person can no longer act. Um, if, if it's a military power of attorney, generally, yes, we are required to accept those, but you know, we may have to do some due diligence on, on those. Um, mail away documents, um, that's when we're not going to use a power of attorney. We're actually going to send the whole package to the person. They are going to actually sign it, just not in front of us. Uh, the Georgia bar requires us to supervise closings. That means that we need to have some level of supervision over anyone that assists us in our closing. So if it has to go to a notary, um, generally we want it to be our um, one of ours on our list because there's accountability with them. Um, they're very good about getting back to us if they've made a mistake. You know, unfortunately, one mistake that happens a lot with out-of-state notaries is improper execution because states all have different execution requirements. We try to tell them how we want it here, but sometimes they can't do it. But if we use our notaries, they tend to be very helpful with us. We're also willing to send it to an attorney in another state or title company. Um, but yes, we need time to work that out. Um, if we cannot get the mail away documents out before the closing date, there will be a delay in funding you know, past the closing date because we have to get them back. I did wanna bring up powers of attorneys or mail aways that happen in another country. Um, generally, I would say you wanna avoid it. Um, it can be quite complicated. Um, if they are a member of the Hague, Hague Convention, which is, there's a list online we can look up. Um, you can use a notary there, but they have to attach what's called an apostille. Um, which is a special attachment that they may not be familiar with, but we need to use a notary that, I mean, they need to find a notary who, who knows what that is. Uh, otherwise, you have to sign at an embassy. So if it's a non-Hague convention country or they just can't find a notary who can issue an apostille, then they need to go to an embassy. So, you know, if you know they're gonna be out of the country, it might be a good idea to work with us to get them a power of attorney ahead of time. Um, you know, we just need to uh, kind of know ahead of time to anticipate some of the issues we might have. Um, that's it for me. So just let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> you can set a chat or unmute yourself. Hi. Hey. Can you hear me? I, I can. Thank you for doing this. I didn't realize, you know, Doug, it was on the, um, I don't know if it was the newsletter or I had 123 on my, on that newsletter or something. And then last week, I changed it. So anyway, you just so you know. Um, but I did have questions. Right. Um, I, I just made them along the way, like little notes. Um, are you, like, when there's a finance contingency or um, are you seeing a lot of these payoff penalties? If they're getting a new loan, right? Are the banks requiring the payoff penalties? Are you having to do that often these days? You mean prepayment penalties, like loans with prepayment penalties? Right. Like new loans, 
that won't allow them to pay off with a, within a certain period of time. We Otherwise, are, they have to pay X amount to. Not at all on the, um, not at all on consumer, you know, regu regular residential owner occupant. Um, investors, do we, are we seeing that on investors? Barely anymore. I mean, I think every once in a while an investor loan might have one, but um, not for owner occupied. I was just curious. Yeah, because that's what I do. A lot of, I do like commercial leases. So the entity mm -hmm. and the investors sometimes comes into play, like my landlords that are leasing retail centers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have payoff penalties from these um, old loans, if you will. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, from the I ones they're paying off. Yeah. And it I might be like a lot of that. 10 year and then it renews. It could be a five year and then it renews. And, um, you know, you have a bunch of penalties or it's like readjust it after the five year, you get a bump and then a 10 year and you get a bump. So I was curious if there's, if you're seeing, or are still seeing penalties on that. Um, yeah, know. I mean, I barely ever see, I mean, almost never see a prepayment penalty anymore since, you know, the law changed for, right, I mean, right. you know, we're mainly seeing residential. Right. Um, so, and then I had a question on the due diligence or yeah, the estates the mm -hmm. waiting period. Is there a waiting period in Georgia on the probate? Um, you know, I'm not really a probate expert. I know, um, trying to think, I definitely think, you know, you gotta watch like when we have judgments and foreclosures, There, there is a period of time these things can be, you know, something else can happen they can be overturned there's definitely a notice period for right. probate you know right. I don't do pro I mean I don't actually do the probate so I don't know the exact but there is there is a notice period I've seen and I, I don't want to create any expectations but you know I was at a firm once who had and he sadly passed away recently but um who had an attorney who knew how to do probate and so he would he would do it and um he did one in three weeks once. I was like, whoa. But, you know, I, I would say the main thing about that one was it was probably very simple, like one heir, you know, who was also the executor and nobody to argue it, you right. know, um, right. I don't, and, and that was, that was like six years ago. So, you know, things got a little backed up with COVID, you know, um, I know right now, like the DeKalb County Courthouse is closed till April because of, of the water pipes. This is crazy. I, I yeah, so anything going on there? Right? And down there in Decatur and- um, What's that about Decatur? I'm just working on something in Decatur yeah. and uh, you cannot get a hold of anybody. I'm trying to confirm some zoning and planning and it's gonna mm -hmm. sit in there and they've always had a water issue. Um, so wow. anyway, I told my clients it flooded, so you might not want to lease that one. <laughs> I live there. I mean, I live in Decatur. I'm there right now. So yeah, I know just, we are, um, we just, you know, uh, dug forward as some title insurance communications, I guess, you know, it's just going to depend on who you insure with. Some will accept a certain level of, um, just kind of going online and doing the title right now, but you do commercial, so they may not, you know, be as willing to. Uh, that's true. Uh, there, there's a little more flexibility sometimes with residential than commercial. With respect to the time lag for the probate, there are a number of different variables. Some counties are faster than others. Also for the probate to be uh, immediately effective, it has to be probated in solemn form. There's another type of probate called probate in common form, but it's not effective for real estate for until the passage of three or four years. So it must be probated in solemn form for real estate needs. Part of probating in solemn form is a four week notice to debtors and creditors. So that's one of the pacing items for probate in solemn form. Uh, but once we get the uh, through probate and the two things we're looking for are really three things. One is that the personal representative, whether executor or administrator has the power of sale. 
were looking for the final court order appointing the person as the personal representative, either the uh, executor or administrator. Right. And the third thing it, when they do that is they issue either letters of administration for an administrator or letters testamentary for an executor. So those, once we have those things, that's when we say, okay, now we are ready to, to proceed. We have power of sale. We have a court order naming a personal representative and they've been granted the letters of administration or letters testamentary. So they may now act on behalf of the deceased estate. Right. So that's, yeah. And that's similar to what I had to do um, years ago in Texas, actually. Um, so also, um, so I had this entity, entity, um, four owners and the the secretary of state and the title i think i had talked about it with you doug a long time ago um so there's four owners and i cannot i could not find out which one had signature authority like and what's on the secretary of state and the documents that were filed um, didn't show it, it showed an attorney. And, you know, that's why I was asking, is that information public? The, the short answer to your question is it is not. And what is a public record is the creation and formation of the entity. Um, but that said, for example, our firm is Schaeffritz and Dean LLC, and you'll find it in the Georgia Secretary of State corporate records. What it won't tell you is who is the appropriate signatory for that LLC. And that's where you need the help of the entity to provide their corporate documents. Right. For example, so an, operating, yes. right, an operating agreement will show members and managers and will right. indicate who has signing authority. Another way to do it is by corporate resolution where it identifies all the member managers of the LLC or all the corporate officers and it says through a duly called meeting, we are the proper people right. and we have appointed so, so and so to be the corporate signatory. So a corporate resolution is another thing that we can rely on. But to your point, can you determine who, who should sign by public records? And the answer is not necessarily. And it's interesting because on these commercial leases, there's no title check. Right. You know, and so I had a coming property and they had like coming LLC and then they had coming prop for properties LLC. And they told me that the property was in the coming LLC, for example. And I said, no, apparently the county has it as coming prop LLC. And they recently changed it, actually. Sorry, my doctor. <laughs> so, um, anyway, they recently changed that um, on the lease, and then they backed out of the lease after it was all said and done. But I couldn't get a straight answer. So it's really difficult to try and figure that out from, I don't know, a, you know, a layman's term. If you will. Well, one thing, you know, and, and we're always happy to help, you know, like we have abilities to look things up, but you can, you can, um, uh, you know, look the tax records up, you know, um, put the property address in there. And especially like DeKalb, super easy. They're all pretty easy. Um, and you, you just put the address in it there and hopefully it'll pull the property up unless there's something funky about the property. And yeah, they're, now they're everybody, uh, yeah, sorry, excuse me. Now everybody wants that private. I mean, I like it private for my own security, but um, yeah. you are, I'm finding that they just have their attorneys listed now. Um, and they're trying to get ways around it. Um, oh, to, so that you can't get to them. Right. Yeah. 
I, I was if just saying, like, just if you need to know. Yeah, if you need to literally know who owns it, like that's just one way. And and also with the caveat that that was as of January 1st of the year you're looking at it because um, they don't necessarily change title uh, tax records more than, you know, once right. a year. So I, you know, I'm, I'm wrong if there was a recent title change. But, uh, you know, if you know how to do an online title search, um, you can kind of, you know, we, everybody starts with the tax records because also right. the tax records a lot of times give a deed chain and that's helpful. And, but if you know who the owner is um, on the tax records, you can also look that name up if you know how to do an online search and like yeah. see if they've conveyed it out and, you know, things like that. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, this is the thing we deal with, especially if you're in commercial is the endless Trend. endless cycle and conundrum of entities people basically put up to make them unidentifiable. Yeah, I mean, like, and, I know. and what they do with us is, is, I mean, not like with us particularly, but I mean, what they do is they try to get, you know, kind of tire us out. So they'll send us like one and operating agreement and it'll be like, but you're owned by another entity, which I didn't even get into, but you're owned by another entity I need that entity's documents. I need to get exactly. all the way down to a human being. I'm really supposed to. I've been told that by Scott Logan at First American. You're supposed to get down to an actual human being. But right. sadly, good luck doing that. Now, I would say in residential, at some point we throw up our hands and they have like nobody else ever asked this, and which I've also had the insurers say is not true. They want right. us to get that. Right. Um, but in a commercial, you know, and I've done commercial, I'm not doing a shopping center or anything that huge until you show me it all the way down to somebody. I mean, like, that's just, if there's too much at stake and, and they expect that that's, that's the one thing I like about like true commercial is the people are used to the due, you know, they're used yeah. to the due diligence. They don't act shocked and appalled. They're not surprised by the time they, they just give it to you. You know, like, Exactly. I mean, now they're yeah. assigning stuff and it's hard to follow the trail. Oh, assign so like contract if, assignments. If I'm representing, uh, by a, a tenant, for example, um, I find them all these properties. I spend a ton of time and then they change names or they give it to somebody else. And it is very, very discouraging because the closing per se doesn't really go through an attorney's office. <laughs> you know, there's not, right. there's a lease signing. I mean, you know, it's like a rental, you know, um, yeah. but it's very, and so I kind of do that stuff up front because years ago I had uh, some other agent, she had the wrong um, legal description and plot and um, she was a bear. She wasn't going to pay commissions on a, a residential land property sale. And I'm like, you have the wrong property on the contract. So, I mean, virtually my client was a buyer and is buying a plot down the street. You know, it's the wrong one. So um, I always check that stuff up front mm -hmm. to make sure I know who I'm working with. Um, anyway, okay, so the last question I had was, um, number seven, was that Georgia withholding on 3%? Is that for my investment properties? You're going to withhold taxes? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it, well, it can be residential too. Um, it's just that if, if it was, if, if the person, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into major detail because then I'll call, like, I'll call there actually is a human being, believe it or not, you can get a hold of, um, I think it's Detroit, you know, it's Georgia Department of Revenue and then really get into yeah. that. Although they, they will still, a lot of times they try not to answer questions, we're stuck, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're still like, I don't know, there's one guy that's pretty nice, but other, but um, you know, if, if they literally, like I'm in Florida right now, like as of two days ago, I mean, like they're selling their primary residence though. I mean, we're not going to penalize them. I mean, this was their house, you know, um, that's, that's kind of the thing, but you know, it can get sticky probably if like you, this was your primary residence and then you, you, you moved two years ago, then right. I would, 
I would, I'm probably going to with, want to withhold because I'm like, that was, but now you have another primary residence. And especially if you've been renting, if you've been renting it out, then I'm like, this, this is not, you know. Uh, but are you talking about collecting 3% on what type of property? Not your primary residence. You're not collecting that. Well, let me, let me give you a little overview, Ninfa. This is Doug. Uh, this is a state of Georgia law that says at each closing, the seller has to sign an affidavit. The affidavit says either I'm a Georgia resident, don't withhold. And this is for any type of property, residential, commercial, personal, res uh, doesn't matter. It either says, yes, I'm a Georgia resident, or it says, no, I'm not a Georgia resident, but don't withhold because I meet one of the exceptions. And one of the exceptions is because it qualifies as my primary residence under federal tax purposes. In other words, I lived there two out of the last five years as my primary residence. I'm selling it. So it counts as a primary residence under federal tax purposes, even though I'm no longer a Georgia resident. So there's really three options. I'm a Georgia resident. I'm not a Georgia resident, but I meet one of the exceptions from the Georgia Department of Revenue withholding. And the last option is neither are true. I'm not a Georgia resident. I don't have an applicable except, uh, ex exemption. Therefore, we have to withhold either 3% of the sales price or the seller can compute a short worksheet where they uh -huh. basically list the sales price and their cost basis in the property, which is what they paid for it plus improvements. And they also subtract out their expenses of sale. From those three items, the fourth number is the computed gain. And if they complete that worksheet, we can withhold 3% of the gain instead of 3% of the sales price. The other thing to remember is this is a withholding. This is not a tax. It doesn't mean they owe that amount. It means we withhold it and remit it to the Georgia Department of Revenue. Next right. year, they file a Georgia tax return, determine if any taxes do, and if so, uh, they have that amount that's been withheld. And if no taxes do, then it's all refunded to them. Right. So if I sell my other home, then they're going to ask for 3%. Uh -huh. Well, whenever you sell any property in Georgia, you have to attest to either being a Georgia resident or I'm not a Georgia resident, but I'm exempt for withholding for the following reason, or they have to withhold either 3% of the sales price, or if you do the worksheet, 3% of the computed gain. Right. So you're collecting taxes and paying the federal and state government. Mm -hmm for that. So I was just curious. I, I missed the title of that section. Whoops, what is that? Is that you making that for me, Scott? This is just a uh, Georgia Department of Revenue. The only federal withholding, the only <laughs> federal withholding is if they're not a U.S. The only federal withholding is if they're not a U.S. resident, and then we have the FERPTA withholding. Right. So anyway, I, I was curious because I was trying to calculate a gain on some property, um, you know, if I sell it. So, well, thank you for doing this. I don't, I feel bad because <laughs> I was the no, only I one. <laughs> no, I'm glad. We, it makes me feel better. Someone got on there. If like one person can learn what they need to learn, you know, and also, yeah. you know, I haven't done a lot of these, so it's, um, you know, helpful for me to have a trial, you know, run. Exactly. But, uh, That's you know, good. call us if you, you know, if you ever have any questions, you know, on any of this I or anything else. It. Call us. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks, Doug, for continuing it with just me <laughs> and Leslie. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. No, of course. We're happy to do it. Thank you, Ninfa. It's good to see you again, even if it's virtual. Take care. Bye-bye.